Now, I don't want to perseverate on this topic, but I think it is an interesting one. So what do you guys think about this element of the demographics, right? So patients in Axie Pembro, my recollection, you know, were largely uh, from areas of the world where they might have, have access to secondary therapies. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a fairly large contingent from what are termed other countries. These are outside of North America and Western Europe. I mean, could that have led to some distinction in terms of OS that we're seeing at this point? So if you look at the across the trial comparison, equal number of patients in axitinib avilumab study and axitinib pembrolizumab study, they got post-trial treatment. Equal number of patients got PDL1 or PD1 directed therapy. Equal number of patients got VEGF TKIs in both arms. So there was no difference post-trial treatment. However, if you look at if you if you just take one trial and see how many patients in each trial after sunitinib, how many patients actually got PD-1 inhibitors, PD-1 access inhibitors? And you are looking at like less than one third patients who are getting these therapies. So yes, I think that remains a concern uh, in my view. Uh, when I'm looking at a very similar progression-free survival, uh, like, you know, the magnitude of progression-free survival is like four months, right? Axitinib and Axitinib Pembro versus Sunitinib. But then you see overall survival benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.53, 10% difference in like patients who are alive after one year. That doesn't seem to fit well, uh, in my view. And that can only be explained by so few patients, so fewer patients actually seeing any PD-1 inhibitor, less than one third. Uh, having said that, I think uh, I will come to the point, time will tell how these trials are going <laughs> okay. to do. Very good. I agree. Like most of our clinics, you know, patients are seeing that immunotherapy in the second line setting, right? If they're on a VEGF TKI in that front line, we're, we're, we're alternating to a different mechanism of action in the second line. So absolutely, the fact that these patients um, were enrolled in countries may, who may not have access to the second line immunotherapy, it, it's, um, it's worrisome. But, it, you know, it shouldn't have factored into that first line, uh, sort of PFS1, right? The first uh, time to progression, and then also the overall survival, you know, improvement um, overall. So um, certainly, you know, a lot to be learned from these trials yet. And I, I circling back to your comment that you're still going to use ipilimumab, nivolumab, and I, I think very much, you know, we're shooting for these complete responses. We want to improve upon the complete responses. So I, I, I hope there'll, there'll be many patient, um, you know, providers and, and physicians like yourself, Niraj, who, who are really dependent on the immunotherapy, pure immunotherapy combination strategy up front um, because we really want to enroll to our phase three pedigree trial uh, through the Alliance. And, and that is really building on that pure immunotherapy combination up front. Yeah, that's Absolutely. So let me just uh, uh, make two comments real quick. So first of all, if you look at the IMDC data, I was talking about like how many patients actually see second line therapy and how many patients see third line therapy. That was a real world population, not clinical trial population. So frailer, older maybe, uh, more comorbidities. And even in that patient population, 51% patients were seeing second line therapy. So that, that, becomes my, that has become my benchmark. When I'm looking at a clinical trial and see how many post-trial treatment therapies were received by this clinical trial, trial eligible po patient population, and if they're not reaching up to 50%, I'm usually, uh, I usually, uh, I'm intrigued, like why not? And then that uh, tells me about the resources and what is available in that given country. Now, coming back to ipilimumab, nivolumab, yes, first line therapy, if I'm going for you know, uh, immunotherapy, I am looking at complete responses. But there are many patients, so just building up on that, I said axitinib, avilumab, axitinib, pembrolizumab, unless I see higher complete responses down the line, but hopefully which will happen, happen. And if we see a progression-free survival or overall survival benefit of 10 months, then another point is why don't we just sequence monotherapy with a VEGF TKI, such as cabozantinib, followed by nivolumab. If you just extrapolate the, uh, just looking at hazard ratio of cabozantinib with sunitinib, 0.48 in cabosan trial, if, and that was intermediate and high-risk patient population. 42% patients had bone metastasis, so very aggressive disease biology population. If you just extrapolate, the, extrapolate to the overall patient population, you are looking at a progression-free survival with cabozantinib of almost 15 months as a monotherapy. 
is a just discussion point, right? Because there's nothing, com we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons of this. So if I'm not able to get complete responses from these regiments of TKI plus IOs, then I'm, my thought process is, why shouldn't I just make it very simple for my patients? Use a wedge of TKI, which is very good, like cabozantinib, followed by nivolumab. And both are associated with five-month overall survival benefit as individual agents. So if I'm seeing a similar magnitude of overall survival in, with axipembro or axiabilumab without really durable, complete responses, my feeling is my tendency would be to just use a simple combination, right? To add a to simple that. sequence, right? Yeah. So to add to that, you know, you don't really know if the sequence is really additive for right for the progression-free survival. Or we had this tweet chat, and a lot of discussion was made about the synergy of the combination and whether that combination really you know prolongs uh, what would have been additive improvement. And so you know, I think in this first-line setting, adding you know what is the right agent to add in. Um, how we should add that in, when we should add that in, you know, should we do an adaptive strategy? Um, they're all pertinent questions and, um, and, and ways we can, you know, hopefully improve mm -hmm. upon treatment of patients in the future. But I think to your point earlier, you know, I think not all patients get second line treatment. And it's unclear if the TKIO is truly synergistic or if we're just covering all our bases, right? So if you have someone though that you're worried about that is, that is sick and you're worried that they have progressive disease, and those, those patients, and if TKIO is approved, I'm gonna go for TKIO in those patients because I wanna cover all bases. Response rates seem to be are the highest with these combinations than anything else. And if I'm worried that I only have one shot to treat this patient, um, I think that there's, there's gonna be a role for TKIO in those, those patients. I mean, the rates of like progressive disease best response are lower with that than anything else. And so I think there are those patients that you're gonna to wanna to think about that combination for the simple reason that you just cover all your bases. Right, you put everything up front and make sure that they can, you know, from whatever mechanism, have a response. Right. I will look at the um, the opposite end of that spectrum. You know, we always talk about the favorable yeah. risk patient, right? Who, or frail patients, comorbidities, right? You know, for yeah. frail patients, but um, just for a moment, uh, thinking about the favorable risk patient who really, you know, do we need the, the added toxicity of the combination, right? And so, you know, we know that pembrolizumab alone from the Keynote 427 trial, cohort A, we have data about pembrolizumab monotherapy as well. There is a portion, about 3%, who have complete responses even from pembrolizumab alone. Alone. And so, you know, is, it, is the toxicity, um, you know, necessary for a combination or can we get by with just a monotherapy and use your sequential approach? Um, but, you know, go ahead with your, your no, frail patient. I, I just want to say I agree with you, Brad, uh, that we are not going to have uh, a perfect regimen uh, right now for all our patients. Yeah. So I think as that's what we learned during our training, right, how to customize treatment. Right. And I think that will continue to be... Uh, 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 the uh, paradigm for now, customized therapy for our patients until we have biomarkers, right? So I think I have not given up on sequencing. That's what I'm saying. Yes. That simple sequencing, cabozantinib followed by nivolumab remains very attractive to me for many patients, such as favorable risk patients, patients with comorbidities, patients who I cannot rely on as far as their uh, background is concerned, the distances from the cancer center is concerned. Uh, I think anytime I have any, uh, if I'm not sure about uh, compliance and uh, uh, or many factors which play in how likely patients are going to call us, I would likely go with a sequence.